Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I am Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson. And we are 62 whole days away from President-elect Joe Biden becoming President Joe Biden. But who's counting? Um, Me. <laughs> all right. We all are. Every day we're counting down. Can it? Let's speed it up. Let's speed it up. Usually you want time to slow down. No, we want it to speed up because what's happening is just out of control. So uh, tonight we are going to talk a little bit about big tech and what's happening there. Our guest tonight is Kara Swisher uh, of, of the New York Times. She'll be joining us in a little, little bit. And our good friend Michael Steele will be with us later on to chat a little bit about what the hell's happening with the Republican Party. Uh, Paul, of course, we always want your questions. So be sure to send us hashtag ask the breakdown on Twitter. Send us your questions. Make sure you direct it to whom you'd like to answer your question. If it's to someone specific, there's the hashtag. And of course, we break it down new school with our Zoom room where you can call in and be a live caller. We'll pl pluck you out and possibly you can ask us a question live on air. And we'll take your questions throughout the show like always. So uh, Rick, you know. Yes, Tara. Before, before we get to the little uh, press event today that everyone's been talking about. A press event? Um, Why, yes, what, whatever what, are you referring to? I, you know, what, what could that possibly be? You know, we, really, we passed a really grim milestone here in this country. There is a raging pandemic still going on amidst this clown show coming out of the White House. People are still dying and getting sick. A quarter of a million people have now passed away thanks to COVID. And... The pandemic is as bad as it's ever been. I mean, we're, it's worse. We set records worse than when the lockdowns happened in the spring. And people are still acting as though everything's normal. This is not a big deal. People are still complaining about wearing masks. They're upset about not being able to get together with their families on Thanksgiving. That's because of their own behavior and intransigence and the, weapon, the weaponizing of wearing a mask. Something as simple as doing that. If we would have just done that early on, and if the president would have acted like a, a semi-normal human being and addressed the needs of this country and not weaponized wearing masks and socially distancing, we wouldn't be here now. I mean, they literally right. have blood on their hands. We've said this many times. It's become a death cult. And with Thanksgiving coming up, we're going to dedicate a show on Monday to talking about covid um, and going, doing a deep dive on that on Monday show. So we're only on one day next week. That's Monday. And uh, stay tuned for that because I think it's an important show and a subject matter that we need to, to tackle um, leading up to Thanksgiving. So I just wanted to put that out there and let everybody know that's what's happening on Monday. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you know, Tara, speaking of press events, did you catch anything great on TV today? Because I did. Oh. I mean, I was a little busy. I caught a couple snippets here and there. There's something about some kind of drippage and something about Chavez and, you know, as a friend of mine who, as, a, as another friend of mine who used to work for him texted me at the time, Leaky Giuliani. Oh, my God. This guy has more nicknames. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, uh. You know... This, it, this is just so apropos of what's happening, right? It's like, we used to call him, uh, my friend Asha Rangappa, she calls him Kaludi sure. Rudy, uh, Fruity G. Um, now we've got uh, Leaky Giuliani here. It's, it's really indicative of their entire legal strategy. It's falling apart. It's leaking like a of sieve course. because they have nothing. They're trying to overturn this election. And in the meanwhile, they're just running roughshod over our constitution and free and fair elections. Just the hell with democracy. Nobody cares about what the scorched earth will look like when this is all done. Let's just spout baseless accusations of election fraud. It's insanity. And that well, press conference, an hour and a half of that lunacy, they are not claiming election fraud in court. 
it's important for people to understand this. They might say this wild, crazy shit out there out in, you know, in the ether on Fox News and on press conferences, but that's not what they're claiming in a court of law. They specifically have said there's not election fraud. That even Rudy Giuliani said it. It's on audio, audio tape of the hearings that they're saying it's not election fraud. Yet they go out irresponsibly and say these insane, crazy things and continue to sow these seeds of distrust in our, our free and fair elections. Well, you know, Tara, I, I worked for Rudy for a long time. And I first went to work for him in 1997. And one of his sort of political consigliaries was a guy named Ray Harding. There's a story all of himself, right? Ray said to me one time, he goes, and he, Ray was a, a refugee from Europe and from the Holocaust in World War II. And he was from Serbia originally. So he still had a heavy Serbian accent. He said, I want to tell you something. Rudy Giuliani, you will often in politics, you can find great men or good men. Sometimes he's a great man. Good man, not really. Um, and, and, you know, when we worked for Rudy, there were days where he was good Rudy and bad Rudy. And, you know, good Rudy was the guy who at two in the morning would race to the hospital if a cop or a firefighter had been injured and sit with the family for hours on end. Bad Rudy has increasingly become, unfortunately, the only Rudy. He knows very well what he's doing. He knows it's all a lie. He knows this is a gigantic flim flam. They are admitting that what they're trying to do is run off the clock on the safe harbor rules with the Electoral College so they can cast this election into doubt, so they can spend four years scamming the Trump rubes out of money uh, by saying the election was stolen. The expert lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, told us so. It is a gigantic grift. It is a huge con. He's in on it. It is, and I've said this a lot, and we've, we, you know, many of us who used to work for him have told him this. You know, if he had stayed away from Trump and given speeches and started a, a, a institute somewhere and done the things that retired public servants do, they would have named high schools after him in New York when he passed on. They would have named bridges after him when he passed on. They would have renamed LaGuardia Airport Rudy Giuliani International, okay? Yep. But now he's going to go down, because of my rule, the inevitable rule of everything Trump touches dies, he will go down now as a minor character in a pathetic last-ditch effort to steal an election that was rightfully won by Joe Biden. It's pathetic, and it's sad. It makes me sad for him on one yeah. level, but I do know that he knows what he's doing. He's not, he's not tricking anyone, including himself, as to what he's doing here. But it is a sign of the contempt for democracy and the contempt for this republic that, that Rudy and Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell, I mean, they're like, they're like three people from a 70s sitcom that went badly <laughs> off the rails today, okay? <laughs> Rudy and the girls! Uh, I mean, it was right. just so insane <laughs> and so bizarre that no one was. It really it. was. But here we are in a situation where we've got a, a a a guy who can get the cameras, being paid twenty grand a day, to is he really though? The fabric is of he democracy. really being paid that? Who knows? That's what they claim, and 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 honestly, who cares? The fact yeah. is, he can still draw the cameras because he's Rudy. That's what Trump really cares about is the media spectacle of this and sustaining it as long as he possibly can. Well, I hope he got his money up front because we all know that Trump doesn't pay his legal bills. So if that's what he's charging him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath about getting paid in full uh, given Trump's reputation. Um, something else that was just nutso at that press conference today, uh, besides the whole Soros, Venezuela, Hugo Chavez uh, nonsense that's been debunked already, uh, Jenna Ellis actually said that they were a, a strike force, like the legal team. Strike force. Strike force. All right. No, you're not. For elite strike no. forces who are legitimately elite strike forces, I'd be very offended. They are third rate legal losers that haven't seen the you know, inside of a courtroom in years. Rudy Giuliani stepped foot in a courtroom for the first time since 1992 and made a complete ass of himself. And it was uh, t difficult to listen to. It was really sad going along with your story about his demise. And this is who they think, tw Trump Twitter thinks that he did a wonderful job. Rudy, we're going to be saved by Rudy Giuliani. I was looking at some of the tweets and I was going, these people have effing lost it. They <laughs> that guy. That's the guy that Donald Trump is 
putting his whole election hopes in, in his legal strategy is this guy? I mean, the, the, the tragedy here is this guy is melting down, literally and figuratively. I mean, he's standing out there looking like a decayed honey-baked ham or something, just <laughs> melting on screen. And it's tragic. And, and, and he's going through these riffs. And, you know, you see some of the tropes that Rudy used to do in the old days. I tweeted about this. This is what we called Bad Rudy in the Blue Room, which is where City Hall press briefings were held, where he would get out there and just, like, throw shit at the wall and make reporters chase the bait. And not many people were taking that bait today because most of the coverage of this event, aside from OANN and, 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 and frankly, not even Fox took much of the bait, but the, the hard edge of the Trump crazy, they were like, this is genius legal strategy. It's only a matter of time now before the Supreme Court. No, it's not. Sorry. Right. Yes. There is no strategy, folks. There no. is no strategy. They are literally one for 26, I think, now in, yep. in court rulings. Uh, you know, CNN was reporting tonight that sources are saying that Trump knows he lost, but now it's just about revenge, getting back yeah. at the Democrats, it's how fuckery. much chaos he it's can fuckery. throw. That's right. Mm -hmm. And well, I don't know why anybody's surprised. This is how he behaves. We expected this. And this is what we worried about if the election was at close at all. I mean, in real yeah. terms, 306 to 232 really isn't that close. That's what Trump won with last time against Hillary Clinton, and they called it a landslide. I mean, he's up by 157,000 votes. B Biden is up by 157,000 votes in Michigan alone. That's o over two times what Trump won overall in the three states to put him over. That's correct. So it's just absurd. And then, of course, before we came on air tonight, we saw that the Georgia recount came back with the results Certified. we all knew. Certified. Certified. Joe Biden won the election. There was no major change or flip in votes. And you voted. They counted. And he lost again. I you know, Tara, I think there's one thing we can agree on today. Yeah. With Rudy. That my cousin Vinny is top notch family entertainment. No question about that. I mean, I have I have to I have to say that moment. Bad legal strategy, but right on the money for pop culture. <laughs> And a bad freaking impression. He couldn't even do Joe Pesci correctly. Right. It was. I'm like, come on. Which Rudy, is amazing you know, because Joe Pesci is from New York. Which is amazing because Pesci used to hang out with him. I mean, it's crazy. It's all. It's you. You know, it's bad when you can't even do a my cousin Vinny impression properly when you're an Italian from New York. Come on, Rudy. Good. Good grief. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. But after all this, Tara, I do think Rudy's going to need some clients after Trump goes down. Oh, I'm sure the Turks will take him or all of his well, you know, international uh, Russian oligarchs. Or maybe not because he won't be useful to them anymore with Trump out of right. office. <laughs> Although I do, think we, I, I do think we have that new ad from Rudy's uh, law firm, don't we, guys? Do you need to invalidate the results of an election? Then call me, Rudy Giuliani of Giuliani, Giuliani and Known Associates. The election law experts. Here at Giuliani and Giuliani, we know all about elections, be they national, local, international, or pro forma. But don't take our word for it. Listen to these testimonials. Rudy Giuliani argued the case today. It was absolutely brilliant. This was one of the strangest court appearances I've ever had. Dangerously malignant and cartoonishly incompetent. At Giuliani and Giuliani, we know the number one problem with elections is voters. You start doing ballots like this. Voters often act against the interests of our clients, inflicting pain, reputational castration that may haunt you and your family business for decades to come. Don't let it happen to you. Just listen to a few of our satisfied clients. Well, you have to ask that to Rudy, but Rudy, I don't, I don't even know. You know, Rudy has other clients other than me. Hey, Giuliani, you're a piece of shit. At Giuliani and Giuliani, we think beyond the letter of the law. We have no regard for our reputation when yours is on the line. <laughs> we'll pull out all the stops to nullify the most votes possible as fast as possible. No vote margin is too large. Don't let our confiscatory rates dissuade you. We get the results you pay for. Call us at 
374-8339 and get the right results certified before it's too late. <laughs> Giuliani, Giuliani, and known associates, <laughs> election law specialists. <laughs> Nice touch with the 666 Fifth Avenue uh, <laughs> right. office address there. Very good. I pay attention. Well to played. Details. Well played, nice production job. team. Well played. <laughs> nice job. Uh, I, I think we should release the rights to Giuliani and let him use that since he'll be begging for client work after this fiasco. No doubt about Oh, it. Giuliani. Just so please. sad. So sad. Mm -mm -mm. Um, I think we have a new seg. We do. It's time. I held up these papers, these affidavits. They're not blank. Steven nice. Dos Santos. Good, nice. good job. Good for the win, Steven yeah. Dos Santos. Oh, so as uh, for viewers who, who weren't with us at the last show, we've started this new thing where we're asking you to give us SAG suggestions since we've gotten so much viewer feedback, people love them. And our creative uh, production team comes up with amazing ones. So we have now, there it is, hashtag breakdown SAG. If you have an idea for us for new SAGs, send them in and our production team will pick the, their favorites and you too can have your SEG dreams come true, just like our last viewer, Stephen DeSantos there. I, so, I will say, very, no very one, cool. uh, you guys need to stop submitting the naked Stephen Gork or na naked Seb Gorka suggestion. It's not going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> I hate to disappoint I was you. I was listening to talk radio today. Naked and Stephen Miller, talking, though, that's coming in uh, now. Uh, someone talked about uh, uh, imagining Rudy Giuliani and, and Trump in a steam bath together, cooking oh. up. These no, insane no, things, no, no. and <laughs> I was like, no, I can no, never no. get that image now out of my no. mind. That's that's awful. No, oh my no, gosh. No, no, no. On, on that note, let's bring in tonight's first guest. There she is. Kara Swisher is renowned for her ferocious coverage of the technology industry. She is the co-founder of Recode and the host of Sway a podcast about power from the New York Times, where she is also an opinion writer. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm enjoying myself watching all your hijinks here. This is our, our shenanigans. <laughs> that song have, is now in my head. Fun. It's replaced the <laughs> Cars for Kids. I know. <laughs> the Cars for Kids one was living in there, but Giuliani oh, and Giuliani shoved it right up to And known associates. Oh, my God. And known associates. And known, yeah. Yeah. Good grief. But you know, I one, mean, thing, you know, one thing about Rudy that we know is he knows about the cyber. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. You remember, he's, he's either you know uh, drunk dialing or uh, or the or the butt dialing or whatever. And then of course the fact that he was going when that happened, I I didn't know what to think. I mean, I knew exactly. What he has he has been uh, he has been known to have a cocktail or two. Well, uh, four I don't ten. know. We've heard. So he's quite a he's oh, quite I, a tweeter. He's quite a tweeter. Let's just say. Yes, his his social media presence is unique. It is bespoke mm -hmm. for certain, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, he doesn't you really know, know the cyber very well. So no, no, not no. really. No, but so, you no. do. But you do, yes, Kara Swisher. Yes, I do. And you have you long really... time been yeah sounding the alarm about the tech industry mm -hmm. and tech run amok. And I have to say that uh, over the weekend, my mom was visiting, and we watched the social dilemma. My my family, wow. my husband, and my mom and I horrified, absolutely mm -hmm. horrified, and. Yeah. Um, it made me want to throw everything out the window and never get on the uh, Twitter machine or the Google machine ever again. Um, and yet here we are. I, and yet here we and are. And yet here we are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, here we I are mean, streaming yeah. dependent on the Google machine. Right. Exactly. And uh, for those who haven't seen The Social Dilemma, watch it. It's on Netflix. It will. It's revealing, very revealing about our habits and what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you... You've been warning about this, and we see the role of big tech and you know social media and where mm -hmm. the, they're starting to put warning labels on on Trump's disinformation and the and the lies that he's putting out there. Facebook tried to do some things similarly to Twitter with that. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it was enough? And yeah. where does social media go from here? 
Well, you know, it's, I, I try to compare it. I, I have been talking about it for a while because I actually know them. And so I, I saw what was happening in a smaller sense with a lot of their other products. It was, you know, even from the very beginning of Facebook, they had issues with Beacon and privacy. You don't remember that, right. but they were, they were sucking in all kinds of information. And so they continue and they continue to break uh, agreements and consent decrees they had with the federal government. That was a big warning signal to me. And then the, when they started uh, pushing out Facebook Live, I was worried about, you know, that there might be a murder on it or a, or a mass killing, which of course then happened and they were seemed happened, unconcerned. Yeah. It, it, they seemed unconcerned with the consequences of their inventions as they became more and more toxic. Um, and so, and, and not wanting to actually intervene and pretend they were a benign platform. Um, and not the media company that they had become across the world. And then I right. started to pay attention in the Philippines and in Myanmar and other places. I, I'm a good friend of Maria Ressa, and I saw what was happening there with sure. Duterte. And, and you could just see, you could really see it coming from down the pike. So that's why I started talking about it. And let me just say, big tech, there's no such thing as big tech. Every te there's a lot of big tech companies. They're not all aligned. Apple is very, uh, Apple and Microsoft very different from Facebook, very different from Google, very different from Amazon. Sure. Uh, but I do think, it, and Twitter is small, actually, if you, if you actually look in terms of its actual size and impact is different, but its size and revenues are quite small. Um, and so I really was worried about the leadership of these companies or some of them, um, in not all of them, in terms of how they were approaching what was clearly a, you know, a breakdown. And so two years ago, before this, I had been writing about this, but about two years ago, my first column for the New York Times was talking, it was called The Expensive Education of Mark Zuckerberg. And I meant, we're paying the price, society is. Right. And I talked about the weaponization of information, of civil discourse, of politics, of everything else, along with the amplification of hate or enragement, uh, which engagement becomes enragement and the, how these business plans depend on fear and loathing and hate in order to, to keep the whole system going. And I did a lot of podcasts on it. And a lot of people thought in Silicon Valley thought I had sort of turned on them. I, it was already pretty tough on them, um, which was whatever, I don't care. Uh, but I really was worried about the impact that they were having. And the fact, lastly, that these were people that were unelected, cannot be taken from power and have cannot be fired from their jobs. You know, usually co corporations the CEO can be fired, but in the case of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg can't. And so you have an unfireable multi-billionaire with wealth beyond belief, with a company that's one of the one of the most valuable companies in the world, with no accountability whatsoever and no laws in place to uh, give them guardrails. So it made me worry, it made me a little worried. Well, you know, Carol, this is one of the things we touched on this when I was on your podcast at one point. Mm -hmm. This idea that that there's no accountability and mm -hmm. that they are that they are weaponizing hate. In some ways, you know, Facebook has become the favored tool of many of these people in in authoritarian regimes. As you mentioned, right. Myanmar. You mentioned the Philippines. You know, mm -hmm. Facebook has become something Turkey. where they Turkey, where they closely cooperate, Hungary, where they closely mm -hmm. cooperate with the government. They give them all the tools in the toolbox, and essentially they build them a police state monitoring system. They can cut off communication. They can do. I, there is a degree to which the recklessness of these things um, ha, has gotten to the point where it's causing an international crisis now. What well, do you it think? It has been happening. It, ha it has sure. been happening internationally. I mean, Maria said, Kara, what's happening here is a canary in the coal mine for what's going to happen over there. And so around, again, around 2016, obviously with the elections, with, when Mark made that famous uh, interview where he said, not the one with me, which was just as bad, but where he said, we had no impact. It's, it's ridiculous to, right. to consider that we had any impact. To me, was, I'm sort of like, everybody gets their information. Half the country gets its information for you. 90% of the people in many countries across the world. It's just a right. ridiculous and you sell And you sell ads because you claim to have vast influence over people. Right. So exactly. how does that so, balance out? Yeah. But, and so I, I was worried about their lack of concern about it and their hands off approach to it as if they were benign, like a benign, you know, a series of tubes. And they're not, you know what I mean? They aren't. They're a weird combination of media and publishing and 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 the ability mm -hmm. to um, iterate and iterate and iterate where a lot of these groups who are malevolent one way or another. And it's not just Trump and, and the GOP. And oh, it's no. not just Russia. I mean, right today, for the first time, I was just looking, Facebook banned this giant anti-vaxxing group. It, now, listen, we're, what are we, a year, a six months into this pandemic? 
nine um, months, knowing yeah. the back nine months, nine months at least, March. Yeah, you're right, nine months. Um, the man who led Facebook's biggest 200,000 member, most odious anti, this is from uh, a uh, reporter who covers this, now QAnon Facebook group has been banned from Facebook, and this is a big deal. Um, they also banned the group. They also banned this group, which was a large space that spread enormous amounts of inf- misinformation sure. of, and, and organized harassment campaigns. Reporters have been bugging them for years about this. This is just astonishing that it took them this long to do something about it. And, you know, as we're facing this pandemic, you're, you sort of sit there anywhere you go, whether it's President Trump or the anti-vaxxers or QAnon, there's nothing happening. Like they don't, and, and they they are doing a lot, but it took them a long time. They're responding rather weak with a lot of weak sauce. This, you know, right. this quote, this tweet may be whatever. Right, and, right. And whenever it's you push, disputed. Disputed. And that's fine. Look, I think it does have, I wrote a column this week talking about it, it does have an impact as, as yeah. it goes, as it goes on. But, but what, what they then do is they try to sort of wrap themselves in the first amendment, uh, which is a woeful misreading of the first amendment, Correct. which is the Congress. Sh- I, I, I know I can read and I know it says Congress shall make no law and people mm-hmm. like Marco Rubio or, or, uh, or, you know, or, or Ted Cruz or others try to, try to act like this is censorship when in fact it is not. It is, it is, is, Facebook can make any law and it has a lot of rules that it just doesn't enforce. And so it creates this chaotic situation, which is perfect for malevolent people, liars, quizlings, you know, misinformation, disinformation, and all, all manners of nonsense that go on and on and on. Russian intelligence, foreign actors. I mean, it, all of those things. And the idea of, censorship versus free speech and all that. I'm glad Mm -hmm. that you brought that up because that seems to be what they fall back on. And, Mm -hmm. you know, people need to understand that the First Amendment is about the government. It's about, you know, the government shall make no laws. These are private companies, right? right, Congress, right? So that's a, a very important distinction that people need to understand. But then the flip side of this is, how do they manage this when they say that they are just platforms because, you know, the whole Section 230 that, that they're, you know, that protects them mm-hmm. and the threat of that being removed. Can you explain that? Because that's kind of been a buzz, you know, a buzz phrase yeah. that people hear thrown about. Section 230, what is that? Mm-hmm. And, you know, is it was something weird. that changed with Biden? Yeah, no. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I think what Section 230 needs to be reformed and changed. It does not need to be eliminated. And the executive order that President Trump did was like a kindergartner wrote it. I think I could have written it better. And I definitely didn't go to law school. Um, but it is, it's is—it's—it's a law that was part of a larger law called the Communications Decency Act, that lots of which were declared unconstitutional. It was 100 years ago when I was started to cover the internet. And it was designed to protect these platforms because a lot of people were on them that they were not control of, like the New York Times has control of its reporters, has control of what it publishes. These platforms had a lot of third party stuff from regular people. And so instead of getting sued out of existence for everything on there, say someone libeled someone or or whatever happened, they passed this law, which was a good idea at the time to allow these online services to thrive. Now, what's happened is they've certainly thrived and they've continued to thrive. And now they're protected by it in that nothing, they're legally liable for almost nothing on their platform, right? And so you can't sue them. And and there is some, you know, my brother's a lawyer. I don't love lawyers, but I like my brother. But um, you you can't sue them. There's no liability. And therefore, there's some good reason for that. And there still continues to be some very good reason for that. But what you have is people, both the Democrats and the Republicans saying, let's get rid of it. I'm like, no, you that will that will end the industry. That will end. Mm-hmm. That will actually end the industry. Um, what you have to do is figure out how to protect small companies from rising up and being able to thrive in the presence of all these giants and allow, you know, allow it so that there'll be more investments in social media, of which there aren't any. The last time there was a social media company that started, it was called Snapchat. So think about that. There hasn't been a search engine created in forever. There, you know, right. commerce platforms, good luck getting, you know, you can have them. Shopify, it's a Canadian company, is the first company that has even slight uh, competition with, with Amazon. It's pretty, it's a very, it's actually a big competition with Amazon. Um, or you have something like TikTok, which was a sort of a competition to Facebook, but of course the Trump administration in their, you know, never ending uh, idiocy about technology went after that, even though 
they are correct to be concerned about Chinese surveillance, something I wrote about years ago. I was worried about this too. And I wrote about having a burner phone when I'm doing TikTok. Um, but it, that's not the way to solve it. And it's certainly not the hill to die on when you have to deal with Chinese surveillance and not being able right. to access the Chinese market. And so you have all these people running around saying really reductive and stupid things, um, including that there's conservative bias. That one just drives me nuts. It's another evidence free <laughs> zone. I mean, Rudy Giuliani is evidence free, but the people that claim conservative bias, just, and when you talk to them off the record, no, we don't think there's conservative bias. They know it. Like, and right, you sort of right. really, I was talking to someone the other day about Part of this. The show. They were they were like, oh, you don't know. I almost reached across the street and punched them. I thought, what, 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 how much would I go to jail if I punched them? Because this is, this is incredible. <laughs> I didn't, I, I don't want to, but I felt it. I was like, are you kidding me? Because oh, we, we feel we you. Really, yeah, but <laughs> we've really all been there. Do, what we have to do is pass bipartisan laws to deal with the power of the tech companies, not anything. Because once we deal with the power, everything else takes care of itself, right? If we have more companies, they're not as powerful. They don't dominate everything. If there's conservative bias, there'll be 20 different things people can go to or whatever. And so it just drives me crazy that 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 there can't be a bipartisan commitment to figuring out how to deal with these large companies that have monopolistic positions all over the place, all over the place. Well, and look, it's the classic crony capitalism trap in DC. Mm -hmm. Facebook has an army of lobbyists, they Google do, an indeed. army of lobbyists, and, and, and they have enormous abilities to dump gigantic sums of money to alter the behavior of either a mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell or a Nancy Pelosi. Or anybody mm -hmm. else in in, in it's leadership. It's more Chuck Schumer, but okay, yeah. But but I, well, I was just going to say, but but I think that anybody hoping that Biden is going to have a massive, you know, reform effort is going to have to get through some very big roadblocks in the Senate on the Democratic mm -hmm. side, um, mm -hmm. and I think that 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 ability to do regulatory capture and to do to do you know legislative capture. Mm -hmm. Facebook and Google and, and a lot of other companies recognized a few years ago that they had to go and buy a ton of people and they had mm -hmm. to go and, and, and line up. You know, you go into Facebook's offices in D.C. and it's like chief of staff to so-and-so, chief of staff to this guy, legislative director for that guy. And I'm not talking about a couple. I'm talking about dozens and dozens of Yeah, they're people. very canny. They've been very canny oh, about yes. that issue. Um, it's still not going to stave off the inevitable, by the way. AT&T had plenty of those people, too. You know, so sure, did IBM. Sure. So did, I'm sure, Andrew Carnegie. You know, I mean, I think that's the, the, the issue. Had that it, of and my, Microsoft did not have that many lobbyists, actually. I had We had a lunch with Bill Gates once at the Washington Post where he's like, I don't like lobbyists. And I was like, you better get some because you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, he, 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 but they, too, you know, they, too, were sort of a very powerful organization that had to have some strictures put on them because they were they were quashing innovation. And, you know, it's what's really interesting is that that every all these different politicians that talk about being for small business and innovation, and everything else, they allow these massive companies right. to continue to sort of shed shadows on on the building of real innovations, which is how we beat the Chinese, which is how we be, became number one, which is how these people became billionaires, is this ability to foster innovation. And so it's a little bit, you know, we're in the here and now where having Donald Trump tweet things that are patented lies is dangerous for democracy. But the bigger picture is the inability for these larger companies to control their impact and for us to control them in some fashion. That is that the, the, the chemical industry has laws, Wall Street has laws, the auto industry has laws. Airlines have lost cigarettes were pulled back and wa put warning labels on and things like that. It can be done. It just, it's astonishing that it hasn't been done for the most important industry this country has seen in, in, a, in two decades. You know, I, I think one of those things, Kara, is that, that there's this belief that that sort of tech bro thing of, hey, all of our tools are morally agnostic. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't, you know, we build them. We don't, we don't tell people how to use them. And there will be a point where, you know, it's like handing chainsaws out in a mental institution. It's going to end up ugly at some point. And these people wow. are going to be held responsible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but these people are going to be held responsible at some point, I think. And you're right. Yeah. You know, every big company looks invulnerable for a very long time until they're not. Mm -hmm. 
it's the old it's the old you know Hemingway thing of you know, the bankruptcy happens slowly then all at once and I mm -hmm. think that that we're going to probably end up seeing that regardless of the regulatory moves that the government makes if any in the coming in the coming years um, just because eventually you know all e even the great platforms fall apart Yes, they do. But it does require government intervention. It really does. And it's yes. not just people tend to like spin off of antitrust, which is going on with Google and the Justice Department right now. Yeah. Ten years too late, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. but, of course. You know, this is pretty much the only thing Bill Barr's done that I think is interesting in any way um, or not horrifying. Um, I think that, that there's lots of ways because you have to think about it systemically, right? Because addiction is related to hate speech, is related to misinformation, is related to dis... You saw that in the social dilemma. It's all related yeah. to this, this, this effort to grab and hold on to the attention economy, of which, which is enormous, and to control the attention economy. And that it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really our most important economy, especially during this pandemic. Most of the... All the companies that's done well, that have done well in this pandemic are all tech companies. Every sure. one of them, they've gotten richer. But I think uh, Jeff Bezos is like fifty billion dollars richer. Some number that's like some, some number like yeah, that. Yeah, it, 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 he was over a hundred billion dollars. He was uh, one hundred eighty-five during this. Yeah, no, he's Crazy. way he's way past. He's yeah, way past that. It, and and it you know, incredible. I know. Well, that you know what? Fine, that's great. Good for him. Stop yeah, I mean, you know, good for right. Good for him as long as it's legal and Amazon is not, you know, uh, peddling disinformation. Maybe some well, piracy with they, you know, fraudulent they actually things, do have they do have do issues they? with marketplace. They have issues with marketplace right. in terms of mm -hmm. st items on there like Nazi items see, and yeah. like that. Oh, not that. quite as bad as Facebook, but still they have that. And they also have the issue of having a marketplace and also selling things which is sort of like, you know, it's they're the company store for some people and a lot of people that are selling things on the platform then get competed against by Amazon. And that's a totally different oh, right. topic, yeah, you know? Yeah, and so, yeah, right. and, and you, have to, you have to really look at these things individually and understand that there's lots of ways to deal with them. You have uh, regulatory things that we don't have. We don't have a pri national privacy bill, which seems insane at this point. And right. you, have, you have state and local laws and states attorney generals that can act, which they did in the opiate crisis and everywhere else. You have fines that they can levy, uh, that would have been pretty weak sauce until now. I mean, Facebook got a $5 billion fine for breaking the consent degree that they agreed to, the previous consent degree, uh, which is like a parking ticket for them, but real fines that could happen. There's antitrust. Um, and then there's just, you know, public acknowledgement uh, by lots of groups like the ADL and others have been doing around Facebook um, to talk about the, uh, to continue to put pressure on these companies to self-regulate in ways that, such as they've done at Twitter and Facebook around Donald Trump, which took forever. Like the fact that, that this, ki this guy has been fed sugar, the sugar high of essentially lying uh, for so many years, and we are wondering why he's, you know, fat, stupid, and manic. Well, guess what? <laughs> we stopped. You know, these people didn't let him eat whatever he wanted, and he's not no no fat shaming. I'm talking metaphorically. No, yeah, but it, <laughs> I don't tend to fat shame, but it's it's literally like giving a kid sugar for years and years and years, yeah. and wondering, oh my God, why is this kid crazy? I've stopped blaming Donald Trump in this. Why wouldn't he do it? Why wouldn't Steve it, Bannon oh, call sure. the heading? Why wouldn't they? Sure. Because no one's there to stop them and they know it. And so they game the system and they continue to do it and spew lies, whatever. Like why, why wouldn't they at this point? Right. You wrote about, they're, you, they're, you wrote about the, you wrote about the sort of lie machine. Yeah. Uh, totally. And just talked about how, how, it's almost reached the point of diminishing returns though, right? I mean, there's, there yes, is a that's what I wrote about. Which, yeah. I do think he's, he's a really interesting case study because I think he's been sort of the, the most adept user of Twitter. I, you know, it's sort of like JFK sure. to television, FDR to radio, him to Twitter. He's used it beautifully. The only other person mm -hmm. who uses it well is uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez among politicians. She's, but she's, she's a different level. She's sort of a native speaker of internet. Um, but he's really good at it. And what he's done really well is he has taken um, the, he's taken the explicit and made it implicit with his themes, his names, like little, little mark, things like that, as cruel as they may seem and shameless and malevolent, they're still very, they're very deft in the implicit, in the implicitness of it. And he, he goes to the line and pulls back, he, he suggests things and pulls back. Sometimes he's quite 
open. But recently in the last month, as he's gotten more and more desperate, they become explicit. And then when you slap yes. those warnings on them, they become explicit in a way that's unfortunate for him because what happens is people start to think, oh, this is like the crazy uncle I have who drinks too much at Thanksgiving, the drunkle essentially, or it's someone <laughs> screaming in the streets. And so I, I see him more like an app that was really popular and everyone thinks he's going to continue and continue. I think it, just like his show, and by the way, I watched every episode of that show, just so you know, I, I love that show, uh, even though I hated that show. I love that show. Um, it went off the rails like so quickly and then dropped like a, like a stone. It was really interesting to see. And you, it, well, it was because of, it became a caricature of itself. Right. It became, as we joke all the time, you know, he's becoming fat Elvis and mm -hmm. uh, to, oh. to continue on with the fat jokes tonight, fat Elvis. Don't and, insult, don't you know, insult no, no. Elvis. Don't insult, not to me. Kara so, has been to Tupelo. I have gone to Tupelo <laughs> and visited his birthday. So do not, fat Elvis was a great Elvis. Then uh -huh. Elvis, tell, Elvis. Tell, the, tell the colonel I need my special vitamins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, oh, you talked about, you talked about the sad. drunk uncle, which is, uh, but before we let you go, I wanted to ask you about, uh, since Thanksgiving is coming up, family, mm -hmm. um, oh. and many folks are not going to be able to be with their families, but some will. Um, mm -hmm. And you've written and talked about your mom, who is yeah. a Fox watcher, and oh, yeah. you know at least you know she comes, she uses Fox News as her primary news source. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, uh, you know the onset with, of the pandemic. You know she's believing what they tell you that it's overblown, mm -hmm. and you know this and that. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, what are your conversations like with her, oh, uh, knowing what you bad. know and where she's getting her source from? You know, is is your mom still a Fox watcher, or is, has it oh. has anything sunken in, or is she still fully invested? If she was invited to Tucker Carlson's for Thanksgiving, she'd go. Let me just say, she likes Brett Baer, but you know, none, I, I watch it because I want to see what she has to say that day. And she said something crazy about something, and I then I went to Fox. I'm like, oh, they just broadcast this, right? So I can follow what she. She's sort of like the president. I think she, whatever they say, she repeats, which is interesting. She is better read than that. She said I was being me, but she does get during the beginning of the pandemic. She kept saying it was just like the flu. And that was right from Fox, you know what I mean? And, and everything else. Right. And, we, and my brother who's a doctor was like, don't go out, it's really dangerous. And she was like, I can go to restaurants. It's not, you know, it just was like, I think a lot of people had this. And so I wrote this piece about it, which made Sean Hannity lose his ever love and mind, but whatever, That's, there's not much to lose in that case. Yeah. Um, and that with a bag of valor. Yeah, whatever, I don't care, <laughs> right. whatever. That, that bag of so, rage, I don't really care. Um, so, really uh, uh, so, recently for Thanksgiving, we want to have her down. She's older. And she, she, she literally, I had to tell her this. I was like, you know, the pandemic is bad. She goes, is it? And I'm like, oh my God, they're not reporting it as bad as it is. Of course, she didn't know there were 250,000 deaths. And I had to repeat a lot of actual news to her, you know, which she now believes when I tell it to her. But what was astonishing is like, you have to get a, if you're going to come down for Thanksgiving, you need to get a COVID test a really good one. And here's the, you know, here's the ones we want to get for you. And then you need to get in a, yourself in a car. Do not stop. Do not pass go get down here. And then we're going to quarantine you and give you another test. Like we're just, we're trying to like get her to come. If you don't want to do this, you can't come. Like we have to do it this way because I don't want, I have right. an immunity to it. You know right. what I mean? Like, yeah. so Is she receptive. It, She's receptive now Not to particularly. it. Particularly. She was, but difficult, difficult about it. But then she writes, she's like, I'm getting a COVID test on Saturday and then driving right down. And and she goes, but I'm thinking of taking the train. And I was like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I literally was like, no train viral, you know, in the air. Are you crazy? I mean, I love Amtrak. I'm sorry it's suffering, but no friggin' train. And it was just sort of, I was sort of like, her information diet is so poor. It's really amazing, like the, the that she would think that's okay, even especially at her age. And and at some point, I said, you know, you can you can be uh, you can be suicidal with yourself on these things because I think it is suicidal. A lot of what's going on, but you can't also be homicidal, right? You can't be, which right. is going. On, that's what's going on is homicidal and suicide. And so I was really amazed by how impacted she was, you know, by the. Thank goodness she's not on Facebook, I guess, in some way. But that she that it's so easy now in this in this information society where things, you know, go to cable, then go to Facebook, and then around, and then it goes around the bend, it gets the president does it, it goes down, it comes back from the bottom, it goes straight up in these groups. It's it's almost impossible. I love my mother, but it's impossible for her to resist it. 
right? The way it is going. Right. And so that's what I worry about. Everyone says, oh, people yep. should just be smarter about their information diet. I'm like, they can't. They're being, their right. mouths are being shoved with processed, highly processed corn syrup food. And they, it, it's impossible to, to be smart Truly. about media, you know, unless Truly. you spend yeah. a lot of time. And I don't know what to say about that. I, I don't know if, how that's, we can go back from it. And that's the social dilemma. You know, that social we face. back to the back to the take, original. Take original your phone statement. and throw it, throw it in the right. ocean. But you can't. It, but you can't. But you can't. Right? But you can't. And uh, that you know, that's where we are. But uh, as my grandfather used to always say, pay attention. And uh, thankfully, we have more opportunities to inform folks. And I encourage uh, our our viewers to follow Kara Swisher, uh, listen to her podcast, brilliant. Way, read her brilliant, columns brilliant. in the New York Times. Yes, she is brilliant. She's in tune with what's going on and you will always learn something and get a good laugh from it. For Kara sure. Swisher, thank you so thank much you. for Can joining us. Can I just us. say one thing thank today? You, we, did, we did, can I say one thing? We did Raj Chetty today, who's gonna to be one of Biden's economic advisors. Yeah, yeah. He's this brilliant, brilliant economist, at Harvard. Mm -hmm. He's, let me just say, I don't wanna insult data and tech all the time. He uses big data to really solve problems and understand where the real problems are. He is an amazing economist. We did a podcast today and so, you think tech is awful? It isn't all awful. And it can really help our world. And if we know where the numbers are, Absolutely. if we know where things are happening. And so yes. I want to leave on that note. So please listen to that one because it will give you hope. We'll do that. Yeah, for sure. Here's someone like that. And that's important because we need to have, we need to end on some uh, uppers because a lot of times it's been very, you know, doom and gloom. Yeah. And that is true. And they even say that in the social dilemma that there are good things too. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Thank like Rudy Karen. Giuliani so on, on, on Twitter. Yes. Yes. <laughs> dripping, dripping. Thank you so much, Kara. Really appreciate Thank you, you coming Mark. on. Thanks. Thank you See so you much. Soon. Bye. All right. All right. Yeah, she's, uh, it, us, it, I could talk get, to her all let day. Us, <laughs> let us get to the big show. Yes. Let's bring in Michael Steele. I think we've got a seg. I held up these papers, these affidavits. They're not blank. God, I can't stand her. Jeez. <laughs> oh my goodness. I wish I could just I'm telling you. Well, get it. ready, Ugh. get ready, because she's going on Fox News about five minutes after she's out of the White House. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I, I listen, Market. I dealt with her for an entire year on CNN I know you next did. to her. You know what that was <laughs> like? Oh my God. Michael Steele, welcome. My friend. Just didn't, like... <laughs> oh, in my mind. In my mind, <laughs> believe me. There were a lot oh, of people that used to send me, you send me take Twitter her messages a, you and can ask take me her to. in a hot second. Oh, please <laughs> listen. I I would tell people that my my tongue is my sword, so I would just uh, eviscerate her verbally because I wanted to keep my oh, job goodness. and stay out of jail. Michael Steele, oh. welcome, my friend. What's up, player players? How's so, it going? Listen. <laughs> Since since uh, we are fat shaming tonight on on uh, the breakdown, apparently I'm going to continue with that theme because I saw uh -oh. you earlier tonight on MSNBC, and you made a comment that made me laugh so hard out loud that my husband upstairs in his office said, "What is happening?" <laughs> and I said, I rewound it, and I said, "Listen to what Michael Steele just said. You were on with Mar Ari Melber and talking about uh, 270." And right. Donald Trump and his, you know, absurd lawsuits. And what did you say about Donald Trump in 270? I said the only way Donald Trump could get to 270 is if he lost 50 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and Hello. He said it just so, so nonchalantly. Um, you know, can I, can I say it. something, folks? I, I don't understand what the hell is going on right now. Joe Biden is the next president of the United States. Why are we still coddling this SOB? Why are we still acting like this man has any relevance at all? He's not going to do anything on COVID, so there's no relevance. He's not doing anything in the transition, so there's no relevance. I don't understand. So I'm like, you know, can we just realize what the deal is here? Tonight, Georgia. Nope, he, he wins. He's got it. Done. Pennsylvania. It's done. It's over. Wisconsin, Michigan. What do you want? Anyway. These idiots like, you know coming from me. You know what I'm going to say to you? These are your folks. 
You these are your <laughs> you Republican are. folks. I know you are. Yeah, you already know what I did a couple weeks ago. And so of course I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you, why the fuck are you still a Republican at this point with these lunatics? Because look, you know, look, I you know, part of it may be a little bit masochistic. I don't know. I you know, I just haven't I don't believe in walking away from a fight that I didn't start. Right. I mean, you come at me. I'm not going to just go, OK, uh, I'm, I'm, I am I capitulate like all these other folks are doing. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand in my spot and make you move me. It's like when they came to me and asked me to uh, to not run again for the RNC chairmanship. <laughs> and I'm sitting in my office and I say, Ryan, you want me to do what? He said, well, I don't think, I don't think you should. You know, you're just not going to win. And I said, you know what? Let me tell you how, how this is going to play. I'm going to piss all you motherfuckers off by running. So there, there you go. I'm running. <laughs> you can't move me. You know, when I go, it's going to be on my own volition, on my own terms. And Donald Trump will not get to set those terms. Now, you know, I don't know what the battle ahead is going to be like. I know it's going to be ugly. I know it's probably going to be painful. Um, that's okay. I've been in that fight before. But, you know, I don't know. I, I just don't know, Tara. For me, it's not that easy to kind of walk away from 44 years of being oh, in the it trenches. Wasn't easy. And it, I know it wasn't. wasn't. Easy I know it wasn't, which you, is you why I admire what me. you did. No, this is why I admire you know, what you did. I admire, I admire Rick. I mean, I admire all my friends who kind of said, you know what? Screw this. I'm done. I, I'll, I'll fight from a different angle. I'm still kind of like, all right, let me just kind of bowl my, <laughs> you know, put the head down and go. But I don't know. Um, well, you know, what's going to happen? There's a, it just amazes me what's left in the party. These idiots no. from Michigan who have accepted an invitation from Trump to come to the White House tomorrow to engage in what is only can only be termed that I I don't use this term loosely. What can only be termed sedition? Yeah, they are attempting yeah. to overthrow the legitimate election that transpired in this country by conspiring with the President of the United States to do so. And I'm sure, yeah. you know, the, 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 the a, a state representative and a state senator from Michigan, they are thinking right now their shit doesn't stink and they're 10 feet tall. And they're coming yeah. down to D.C. and they think they're going to just have the greatest, greatest boost to their careers and their lives. Let me tell you something, people. You are, you know, Mike, Mike Spy, uh, Spivak, whatever his name is. I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up in a second. Spivak. Um, Spivak um, from, the, from the Michigan Senate. They are, these people are absolutely going to go down in history as pitiful little footnotes in a failed conspiracy to steal yeah. the, ele the election from Joe Biden. They will not go down as heroes. They will get nothing out of Trump for this. They will get nothing. They, maybe they'll get a little hit on Fox News tomorrow night. But other than that, they're going to be a part of a scuzzy, low, repulsive effort to steal an election. And that's the kind of people that are left in the party. That's that's the, that's the the the, the best and the brightest. Yeah. Now get the fuck out of here. Yeah, no, nah, Rick, <laughs> I hear you, brother. I hear you. I hear you, man. And 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 I, I could not agree with you more. I, I thought you were going to actually. I, I thought I saw either a tweet from you um, at one point where you referred to it something like, "Now isn't this some fuckery?" I, and I thought. That <laughs> You're going to go there again because as only Rick Wilson can put a capstone on any moment. It's the um, perfect term. Was, it's the perfect term I thought that for was it. pretty damn good. But there, um, they, it is. <laughs> that, and and uh, I hate to tell Trump and, and Jason Miller and Bill Stepien and Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell and the rest of this lunatic crew. Um, Fuckery is not a governmental strategy, nor is it a legal <laughs> strategy that can hold up. It will not right. succeed. The fuckery right. will end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it we're, will. We're seeing it. Well, no, you're right, Tara. We're actually seeing it. But here's the thing about Michigan I want to emphasize over and over again for all those Republicans who are applauding and saying, Lottie, Lottie, thank you, Jesus. Uh, by what uh, these two white canvassers uh, were trying to do. These are the same folks who said that they would certify the entire state of Michigan 
except for where 80% of the black people live. Right. That's right. And so just so we understand, and I, and I said this a little bit earlier today, all, all you black men out there who think Donald Trump's your boy, yeah, that's your boy. That's what your boy's your boy. trying to do. He's trying to disenfranchise your friends and your family who live in Detroit. For all the yep. black women out there who voted for Donald Trump, and there's about 8% of you, that's what your boy is doing, trying to disenfranchise yep. the black vote in Detroit. And so not just Detroit, but in Philadelphia, Milwaukee, and elsewhere, Atlanta. wherever we live, yep. that's what they're looking to do. So let's be honest yep. about that and call it out. And again, to your first point, Tara, that's why I kind of stay in this fight because I got, I, I'm trying to use the street cred, whatever hell little bit I got left to, <laughs> to, to call out this. You know, it's one thing to call it out when you're outside the party. It's another to call it out when you're inside. You know, no, if I, I know. Had endorsed, I'm just messing with you. I know. I'm messing I'm with saying, you, if I had Michael, but... Biden, But I'm saying if I had endorsed Biden um, as a former Republican, eh, but to be in, this is what I, this is what the point I was making to Reigns. You don't understand. Your worst nightmare is my staying, not leaving. Right. It doesn't get better for you uh, when I go. Right. I mean, either way, you're screwed. But staying is definitely worse, which is why they want me out. But look, you know, the fight's going to be the fight. And, and Rick, I, I saw you were on, on air recently uh, speaking to this. Uh, Steve Schmidt has been speaking to this. That's what Lincoln Project is all about. Lincoln Project is first and foremost about our democracy. It's about bringing the fight to those who are now trying to undermine the very value system that we, that we not only grew up on, but that, that is still valuable to future generations. And Look, we, right. we just have to stay in there. I look for I look forward to some great ass kicking over the next uh, few weeks and months um, to make sure starting with Georgia um, and then going all the way through to whatever kind of bullshit comes out in the 22 cycle. And certainly we know what we got coming at hey, us. Hey, Laura Lee Trump's going to run for U.S. Senate in North Carolina. We heard that tonight. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, there's, we, we are prepared to defend against the fuckery. We are, we are anti fuckery. I just laughed. <laughs> why don't we bring up well, a? Uh, why don't we get to a question? Yes. But before we bring the question up, though, Rick, we we were talking about you know fuckery and funny things. So we we started something before the election. Um, we had a very special Abe Lincoln chia pet, and we had a a, a, a poll about whether there it would grow before Donald Trump conceded or not. And I think we have. The progress of our chia. Let's see. I guess whoever said that the chia would grow before Trump conceded was correct. Look, <laughs> does it grow a beard Trump too, or just a hair? The size of a size of a head yeah, I'm gonna say, Rick, Lincoln's gonna have himself a big ass afro by the time <laughs> this thing is right, over. Put a, a fist stick in I'm it. I'm gonna be calling soon. you guys. Can I get a few snips? <laughs> <laughs> really, it's going to be the Angela Davis chia pet soon. It doesn't grow beard <laughs> too or what? Because the, the afro is out. Oh, is my God. Afro. That's funny. There it is. That's it. That's it right That's there. So it. can I just, hey, guys, can I just round out for you? And this is something, you know, I, I, that I just on a serious point because about yeah. really to the broader question about what we see happening right now. With, uh, with what Trump and his ilk are doing. I got a couple of very disturbing emails tonight from some of my buddies in the national security space um, and some other uh, parts of our government. And they, they're right now starting to raise some alerts about what we see with the slow roll here with the certification process and everything. Uh, there's a high degree of suspicion that uh, FBI Director Ray will be gone before Turkey Day. Um, and and that, that's going to be the next kind of step. But the other thing is, um, what I understand right now, you've got um, Bannon and Roger Stone uh, plotting and planning a march on D.C. two days before the certification date of the 14th oh, of December, wow. so yep. on December 12th. And they're trying to get the Proud Boys fired up to cause a little, a little ruckus here in town um, beforehand. I think everybody needs to be alert. 
as much of this information we get out there ahead of time to let people know exactly what's yep. going on. So no one said, yep. oh my God, no baby, this is a plot to overthrow a duly elected president elect uh, and, and to overthrow an incoming government. And it, it, you, you know, like you, Rick, and you don't want to use those terms, but they are the appropriate terms to use uh, when you see what's happening. So I just, just want to put that out there. And I got some oh, other stuff I'm I want to share with you guys at Lincoln Project so that you get the full skinny and know thank how you. to. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, appreciate I'm glad because that actually, that actually tees us up That's for a good our first caller from uh, Patricia in Olympia, Washington. Do we have her? Ah, there she hey, is. Patricia. Uh, welcome, Patricia. Hey, Patricia. Do you have a question about transition? Yes, I do. Um, so I have been thinking that since the Trump administration does not want to do anything in the transition, it has occurred to me, maybe they have no information to transition. And maybe this is a way of just covering themselves for doing little to nothing. And I'm speaking <laughs> specifically about um, distribution of vaccine, for example. What do you guys think? Well, it, I can real quick uh, address some of that. On, on the vaccine part, uh, the, the driver there is not so much the administration. It is the pharmaceutical companies that are developing the vaccine. So it's Pfizer, et cetera. Wh where the administration would come in is on the implementation side. Now, the, the reality of it is there will be nothing available for distribution, as we've been saying from the very beginning, until at least early first quarter next year, possibly mid to late first quarter next year. But nonetheless, it's in, in striking distance. To the extent that there's a vaccine that's available by the end of this year, that's gonna go to a very, very narrow subset, mainly frontline workers, um, the medical professionals, uh, the EMTs, and those who are having to come into constant contact daily with the virus. And that's a fairly easily, uh, distribution system to set up. Um, but to your point, more broadly speaking, with respect to other aspects of the transition, basically because the president has told all the, the staff and the secretaries don't do anything, you're right. There isn't anything to transition per se, um, but that doesn't mean that there's not valuable information that the Biden team can still get uh, as they're looking to start up uh, new operations on the 20th. So it, it presents a little bit of a problem um, because there is, there is some things that, well, are some things that folks need to get inside, you know, Department of Homeland Security, the Education Department, uh, the Commerce Department uh, to begin to see, okay, where did you leave off? What have you done? What, what we, right. particularly on the foreign, foreign front, what, what, what contracts, what arrangements, what agreements have you come up with foreign governments? So they're creating quite a little bit of a, a shitstorm for the incoming team um, who could probably start in a very difficult box because yeah. there won't be a whole lot of information coming forth to those guys between now and January 19th. Unless, of course, there are good people inside the government, which I, I'm hearing, are, are talking to the Biden folks anyway and giving them the heads up to get you to let them know. So they're, they're yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's the worst kept secret in Washington, but uh, right. you know, who knows? There's, there's some kind of something going on here where uh, folks are, they're still communicating with them. But nonetheless, it, it's still yeah. problematic that they're not cooperating in the official transition. And, um, you know, that can create a whole lot of problems. So. And Tara, on your point, where shit. you're right, is, is the difference is they can't physically hand over documentation. Right. But right. I can tell you. Right. Who I talk to and what yeah. I want to be, you ought to be thinking swimming. about asking for this. It's right. yeah. Yeah, a, <laughs> right. So you know what if what if you had asked this question about this X Y and Z and you know perhaps right. the just answer would be this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just hypothetically, in a purely notional way. What if you were to right. pursue the following line of inquiry? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. There are Not ways that I would ever here in Washington. Just that. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Uh, who's okay? We've got our next caller. We have um, uh, Tommy from Oakland, California. Welcome. Hey, Tommy. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for helping to keep me a little bit more sane over the last few months. 
I appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. You. We no try. Um, <laughs> I am. Um, I'm alarmed. I think the biggest problem is that there, this not having common facts. In a sense, it's like sure. we're in a tower of Babel. And mm -hmm. um, there seems to be this unwillingness to deal with this problem because of freedom of speech. But we do regulate speech. It's not legal to um, scream fire in a crowded theater. I'm not really right. sure why we feel as a society that it should be legal to scream fire on Facebook. And uh, I don't, I'd like to know if you've thought about how to frame this, that we might be able to move this forward. Um, I didn't, I signed on in the middle and I didn't catch uh, the woman you were talking to before. Yeah, Kara Swisher. Kara Swisher. Oh, and, she was awesome. Um, yeah, she was awesome. And I know those arguments about uh, keeping the internet um, innovative. And that was why they passed those laws way back when to protect um, the internet from these lawsuits. But there has to be some way where we can rein this in. We have to have common facts or, I mean, yes, we get to vote, but if people don't know what they're voting about, it's not a government of the people. What are your thoughts? Well, let me, let me say this uh, initially, and, and I, your, your point is very well taken. We do have a country with these hermetically sealed information bubbles and silos. And right now, it is impossible in almost every meaningful way to penetrate those. Um, we are going to have to make some decisions as a country, as a society. At some point, do we want to just be fed the things that we think taste good all the time? The sugar rush, the, as, as, as Kara Swisher said earlier, like the high fructose corn syrup, um, you know, on the right or the left. There, are, there is a tendency for Facebook and other social media platforms to give you more of what you want. And when they give you more of what you want, then you want more and more and more, and they keep feeding you that one channel, that one aspect of your, of your information diet. Uh, you know, there is a personal responsibility aspect to it, but there's also a, a governmental responsibility aspect to it. And that's something we have to really face up to as a country because, you know, there will come a point where Facebook is more powerful than any other institution mm -hmm. at all. And when it comes to shaping our politics, and that is a dangerous place to be with one guy in one company who runs the entire company who is unaccountable, unfireable, and untouchable. Yeah, I, yep. I, I, could, I could not agree with that more. Uh, it is, I mean, imagine a smarter, younger, more sophisticated, stylized Donald Trump in combination no. with a Facebook, right? I mean, we've seen what Donald Trump has been able to do with Facebook as Donald Trump. Right. Imagine you, you elevate that game up. Oh, baby, you are talking about a whole world of hurt. A lot of the stuff that Lincoln Project has been able to ward off, undo, um, you know, and fight back on was it because it's Donald Trump. But imagine, sure. um, imagine, imagine someone who is as sophisticated at at communication as a Lincoln Project, or 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 other inst entities or organizations in putting out a, a powerful, strong, you know, democracy oriented yeah. message. Uh, it's sure. But they've got an anti democracy message. I mean, I think that's something that the caller really has put a, a, a good finger on. And Rick, you you just summed it up, man. It, it this is the future we need to guard against right now, in my view. For sure, absolutely. Which is uh, sure. another reason why that we continue to hold accountable the enablers who have propped up Donald Trump and his clown show, yep. um, and you know the Ted Cruz's, the Mitch McConnells, who know better. All these guys know better. Josh Hawley and you know, mm -hmm. Tom Cotton, these guys, they freaking know better, but yet they continue to prop them up because they're looking at the political expediency of it right now and maintaining power. Um, and to enable this level of unconstitutional insanity is just incredibly unacceptable. And at the Lincoln Project, of course, we always have a response to what we see going on. And we'd like to take a look at our new ad called Leaders. Washington is full of Republicans with big egos and bigger ambitions. 
Remember them. Rubio. Cruz. Holly. Cotton. Lee. Haley. Soon they'll all be running for president. They're planning for it, even now. They'll tell you they're brave, strong, principled, conservative. But the reality is right in front of you. They're weak, spineless, cowardly, corrupt, shaking in fear of a mean tweet. Traitors to the ideas and ideals of the country. When America needed them to stand tall for a peaceful transition of power, they sided with the loser. When called to end abuses, they shrugged. When called to lead, they cowered. When called to speak the truth, they lied. Call them whatever you like, but don't call them leaders. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. I love that. I love it. I love love it. it. Starts tomorrow. Starts tomorrow. Man, that that is such a strong ass ad. And they didn't want, you know, a lot of these guys don't want to say they're running for president, but that's why they're doing this. That's why Cotton and Hawley and Rubio and and Cruz and the whole rest of this gang are acting this way because they're afraid if they run in a primary against Donald Trump Jr., they can't be wrong with daddy. Well, that's the thing. If Donald Trump Jr. is in the primary, fuck him no matter what they do. You might as well just sit your ass down. You ain't going nowhere. You, you're running for number two at that point. You're looking to be the guy who's going to carry Donald Trump Jr. book briefcase and say, yes, yeah. sir, that's what I'm looking to do. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's Deputy <laughs> Assistant Secretary of, of Toilet Seat Standards at the Department of Commerce, you know, Josh Hawley at that point. <laughs> oh, my this gosh. Well, me, Rick, these guys actually think that they're somehow going to outposition Donald Trump for 24. Insanity. It is the, it is definitional insanity. It's truly <laughs> bonkers. And you know what, Michael? Those are your folks. On that <laughs> note, we're going to say good night. Have fun hanging out with them and go leading up to twenty twenty four. Michael Steele, they are your problem now, my friend. <laughs> we love you. We'll see you next love time. You, Look, I'm putting all my kids on timeout. <laughs> Uh (laughs) we shall see we shall see bye Bye. (laughs) i'm gonna bust michael michael Steele's chops on this forever i know he was very sad to lose me as a comrade in that fight but we will still fight together i just will not have an r next to my name so i can continue to give him shit for keeping it (laughs) but i love him i love him it's my big brother truly truly one of the my oh my people. goodness well i know we need to wrap and you've got to you've got to go so um yeah. i just want to do our quick call to action and then we can wrap it up mr wilson um join to you know go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll do the call to action and you can sign us off um all right. so we're beginning to you know get into this very difficult period um you know this this dark winter that 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 Joe Biden has mentioned, we're seeing what's raging with the pandemic. Um, we see that Trump is refusing to cooperate. He's just causing this chaos continually because the cruelty is the point, as we have seen. But we want to just encourage all of our supporters and our viewers, those are, those are the folks that have been with us here at the Lincoln Project and look to us as a, a beacon of hope and some sanity and levity here. But we want to encourage you, do not let your guard down. Stay sharp. Right. Strap up, pay attention, know that we are doing the same. We are still on watch here. Abe is still watching and working. And Every election day. day was not the end, okay? But it was just the beginning of the next phase in this fight to save our democracy from these anti democratic forces. So we're all this together. Stay vigilant because we will stay vocal. Don't let them bully you into silence and continue to stay engaged because. We will be here with you to do that. So on that sure. note, uh, we have one last ad for tonight, and then we're out of here. They're at it again, trying to take away our right to vote. David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler support Donald Trump's plan to strip Georgia voters of our right to vote. Black and military voters will lose their voice. You can stop it. Vote for Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. We've come too far to go back to Jim Crow. We made history November 3rd. 
Let's do it again. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Well, folks, tomorrow join our friend Jennifer Horn at 2.30 East Coast time for Vote for America. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you guys next Monday. We will only be on Monday of next week uh, because of the holiday. And we will see you again then. And keep the faith, everybody. Oh, a bunch of people have asked me what's going on with the forehead. A little bit of skin cancer. Pay attention to your dermatologist. Wear a hat. And a Get mask. <laughs> and we'll a see mask. you on Monday. <laughs> guys. The 2024 presidential campaign is going to begin later today as soon as Joe Biden is, yeah. is declared president-elect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're going to see guys who even who are up for re-election in 2022, they're all going to be auditioning. Reed, I need to sleep for a month first. I know, right? <laughs> I know. Um, but the poor people in Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina are never going to get a break. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. How bad is it? Your back, knee, or neck pain? My knee pain was awful. I probably tried the same things you're trying to manage your pain. Topical ointments, pain relievers, fish oil, but nothing worked. Then I tried Omega XL. And here's why. The underlying cause of painful achy joints and muscles is inflammation. The key is to knock down inflammation before it causes permanent damage. Backed by 35 years of research, that's exactly what Omega XL does. Nothing comes close to doing what Omega XL does. There's nothing like it. If you're suffering with painful, achy joints and muscles, stop wasting money and switch to Omega XL. Order Omega XL now and get a second bottle free. Visit OmegaXL.com slash Rudy. That's OmegaXL.com slash Rudy or call Project is responsible for the content of this advertising.
Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Just watching my algorithms get crushed. I guess I did something to piss off the Instagram gods, so hopefully you're seeing this stuff anyway. We'll do what we can. Talk to you soon.